Well, I, I already named him. He's he's from Fergus County, and the only historic cowboy I could think of from Fergus County was Teddy Blue Abbott. So he's his name is Teddy Blue. And you're 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 very lucky I didn't insert a slide of him in here. So, but that was was Teddy. Well, there you go. It it was a hard fought battle, uh, for sure. My my wife held out for a long time. Um, as you know, we're all finding out here, uh, World War I still resonates pretty strongly um, on a lot of different levels. Uh, and I think one of the most interesting aspects of that is how it resonates with us on a personal level because we all have, you know, our personal stories and so forth. So uh, the card I grabbed was Daniel J. Uh, Arsted, which is my grandfather who immigrated from Norway in 1901. Uh, when he was 14, um, got married in April of 1917, uh, was drafted into the military uh, the following year in June of 1918. Um, he and my grandmother had 11 kids. Um, my grandmother's family, uh, her mom and uh, her younger brother were both died of uh, the influenza. Um, her younger brother's name was uh, Clarence, and he died on December 5th, 1918. Seven years later, my grandparents had their fourth child, a son, who was born on December 5th, so they named him Clarence Ben after the uncle who had died. Clarence uh, was drafted into the military in 1944 and served with the 84th Infantry Division, the Rail Splitters, and was killed in action in April of 1945. And he and my grandfather were both uh, buried at the military cemetery there at the Little Bighorn. And when I was about eight years old, um, we were on our way to visit family and so forth, and we stopped like we occasionally did. And we're going through the cemetery and, and uh, you know, paying our respects and so forth. And I walked up to my uh, uncle's headstone, and I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, well, there's something really familiar about this. And then it dawned on me that we had the same birth date, December 5. And so I... I asked my dad, I said, did you know that? He said, I had no clue. And he said, I'm not surprised your grandmother didn't say anything either. So it's kind of an interesting uh, storyline. What really freaked me out was when I went up on the hill where uh, Custer and his boys met their end and noticed that Custer's birthday was December 5 as well. So, well, I don't know about that. But and it, it, as bad as it might be, to say it, 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 I've fortunately outlived them all, so <laughs> let's knock on wood on that one. Yeah, that's a good thing. So this is going to be kind of a 30,000-foot uh, view of what occurred in Montana between the declaration of war in April of 1917 um, that Wilson asked for from Congress to the end of the special session in February of 1918 after Governor Stewart had come to the conclusion that there was a need for a special session and there was a need for some laws, some legislation on the books to help Montana ramp up its, its efforts um, in support of the war. Um, and um, I love this quote from former National Security Advisor Sandy Berger who wrote that history is written through a rear view mirror but unfolds through a foggy windshield. And so that kind of got me thinking about this presentation and the fact that the goal here is not to figure out a way to peer through the fog, but look at the different layers of the fog that blurred the windshield at that time for these folks so that they made the decisions that they did um, and how they came to those conclusions and so forth. And, you know, uh, I. I guess when you're looking at things um, historically, World War I is a, a very good example of how badly things can get out of whack um, as the fog thickens, and that's exactly what it did. Um, and it's interesting to me that, you know, we have 100 years of emotional distance from the war. Um, we have the clarity of hindsight and the hubris to think that we could have done it better. Um, but in reality, we still struggle with those same issues today that they did back then, immigrant versus native, uh, labor versus capital, Democrat versus Republican, rule versus urban, diversity versus uniformity. I mean, those, those issues have not gone away. We've, 
we haven't resolved them. Who knows if we're going to resolve them? Um, but they still play um, in our history today. Uh, as Zoanne had said earlier, uh, you know what happened during World War One laid the groundwork for how the 20th century unfolded and how the 21st century has continued to unfold. So it makes it an extremely fascinating period to look at. And I know that, you know, after lunch and listening to the tuba music and so forth, this is typically time to take a nap. I just want you to know, feel free to do so. I'm, <laughs> I'm fine with that. Um, just be aware I reserve the right to take my smartphone out, turn it on video, and then scream grenade at the top of my lungs and <laughs> see what kind of reaction that we get. So by the time President Wilson felt the need to go before Congress and ask for a declaration of war, um, the tension had been building in this country and in Montana. Uh, immigration, um, the 1910 census uh, showed that over 25% of the population was foreign born or the child of foreign born parents. And there was a lot of labor discord that was going on. As a matter of fact, uh, just before World War I started in Europe in 1914, Butte was pu uh, put under martial law. Uh, there was an invasion in the High Line by the industrial workers of the world who were trying to get it to Butte and support the striking miners that were there that concerned Governor Stewart greatly uh, uh, early on in his first term as governor of the state. And so there were reasons to be suspicious of about uh, the loyalties and so forth of certain uh, individuals in the country and in the state and the IWW, the industrial workers of the world, were uh, one of the largest players in that unease uh, and they'd actually had a fair amount of success in organizing in Montana beginning in 1907, um, initiating two successful strikes against the Summers Lumber Company up on Flathead Lake where they won concessions from the company. Uh, Summers Lumber Company was actually a subsidiary of the Great Northern Railroad uh, so, you know, the, the Wobblies had a proven reputation on being able to take on the big boys and, and win. Um, by 1909, 1910, they had done a fairly good job of organizing a lot of Western Montana's uh, timber industry. And they not only preached higher wages and safer working conditions and better food and those types of things, they also preached the overthrow of the capitalist system. So you can see where it might make folks a little nervous. Uh, and Montana had been one of those hotbeds of labor unrest for a number of years since the 1890s. So, you know, nobody was really too sure when the revolution was going to break out. They were just sure there was going to be a revolution at one point. And World War I seemed an appropriate spark for that. Um, but not everybody was, of course, in support of the war. We hear a lot about Jeanette Rankin's vote uh, in opposition of the war. But in fact, um, she was one of uh, 49 other representatives, or 50 representatives, excuse me, who voted no on Wilson's declaration. And six senators, U.S. senators, voted no on the war measure as well. Um, those, the reasons varied for why they did so. Uh, there were those who were um, adherents to George Washington's uh, advice in his farewell address about getting involved in foreign entanglements and so forth. Uh, then there were individuals like Robert La Follette who believed that it was a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. And that if you were going to conscript poor men to fight in Europe, then you should be able to conscript rich men's money to pay for the war. And so that was, that was of concern as well. And then there were individuals like Jeanette Rankin who just absolutely found war too horrible to even contemplate on any, on any measure. Um, and feared the slaughter that would occur. Uh, you know, we're three, we're, we're three years into the war already. There's a million plus uh, casualties. Um, actually, there's probably more than a million plus casualties on both sides of the war at this time. I mean, they've been reading newspaper reports about the slaughters that have been taking place in the trenches and so forth. So, you know, the last thing that Rankin wanted to do was see American boys serve overseas in that kind of hellhole. And you can't really blame them for that. And then, of course, you had those folks who believe that we should have gotten into the war earlier. Um, Teddy Roosevelt is a prime example of that. Um, they also believed that by going to war in Europe, the United States wasn't only saving France and Great Britain and its allies from uh, the Kaiser, uh, 
but they were also saving Europe itself from its traditional um, monarchy and so forth, and they were going to actually go there, win the war on behalf of the Allies, but also end um, that monarchy style of, of government that was in that was in Europe. So they saw it as a, as a twofold um, um, effort on their part. There was also a fair amount of xenophobia that was going on um, prior to uh, his, his ask for the declaration of war against Germany. Wilson had been on the stump um, talking about uh, the dangers of the hyphenated American and the fact that if we, that you were going to be an American, you needed to be 100% American and that you needed to get rid of the hyphen in the middle of your name or the middle of your ethnicity. and. Uh, as such, some of this saw this as an opportunity to, to if in any other way, turn up the heat on the melting pot and kill that hyphenated American notion and just have Americans, whether or not you were immigrated or not. You weren't German-American, you weren't Irish-American, you were just American. Um, <clears throat> and, of course, Teddy Roosevelt saw the war as a great opportunity um, to help promote democracy in America and this notion that um, there was opportunity for all. He believed that by having the soldiers, regardless of their social class and, and whether or not they were a hyphenated American or a native-born American or whatever, that by having those individuals sleeping next to one another in the tents, there was no greater way of bringing the country together uh, as as Americans, um, and he, he uh, compared it to the public education system as a way to create 100% um, Americans out of the situation. So it's kind of interesting how that unfolded. The other part of this is not, you know, as, we, as I mentioned, not everybody was interested in, in fighting this war. So and on the federal level and on the state levels as well, they had to manufacture support for the war. And ways that you do this is run, you know, a very active propaganda campaign talking about the atrocities that the Germans are, 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 are perpetuating against the Allies and so forth and the reasons behind, you know, saving democracy and those types of things. So that had to have been manufactured as well. Um, Michael Kennedy his book uh, over here um, is is a great read about how that happened in the United States and how they how they promoted that. Um, the individual responsible for doing this in Montana was Governor Sam Stewart. Uh, he'd been elected in 1912. He was considered a progressive in that he supported um, women's suffrage. He supported prohibition um, and another. Uh, some other progressive ideals and so forth. But Stewart wasn't a fan of labor unions, um, and he uh, was really nervous about the IWW. As I mentioned, in 1914, uh, there had been that invasion along the High Line where supposedly an army of 1,500 Wobblies that were armed to the teeth were going to come to Butte and take over Butte. Uh, in fact, it turned out to be about 150, and that they were just coming back from the harvest fields in the Dakotas. They really weren't interested in starting a revolution, but it did concern um, Stuart. So to him falls the task of getting Montana on a war, fi uh, war footing. Um, the Montana legislature had adjourned about two weeks before war was declared, and so he wasn't going to get a lot of legislative help um, in, in getting the state um, ramped up to go. One of the things that he did do, however, was go ahead and put together the Montana Council of Defense. Uh, it didn't have an appropriation, so he borrowed money from various state agencies to finance the organization uh, early on. So in the back of his mind already is this notion that he's going to at some point have to have some type of special session in order to provide some legal standing for the Council of Defense. Um, the National Democratic Party was not interested in seeing states have uh, special sessions at this time because they felt that with the declaration of war under a Democratic president and so forth, it just opened the door for the Republican Party to swoop in and, 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 and take the initiative and run with it. And so, of course, it's always about the next election. And so at a, they were urging uh, Democratic governors to refrain from having a, a special session at all costs. 
but Stewart was actually inundated with requests from citizens across the state early, early on about a special session and the need for a special session. And, you know, the Council of Defense was one reason. Um, the other was this, this new notion that had, had come out, unfolded on the, uh, on the federal scene when Stanford diplomatic historian Ephraim D. Uh, Adams defined what he called indirect treason. Um, agitators, socialists, tax reformers, pacifists were all guilty of treason because they failed to subordinate their agenda to the national war effort. And so folks uh, latched on to that idea and they believed in it and, and as we saw when we did the tour of the exhibit and so forth, there were those individuals who weren't afraid to, to uh, speak their minds about their opposition um, to the U.S. entry into the war. And so there was concern about how we were going to handle those types of, di of individuals. The other interesting th thing about this is that with the declaration of war, um, Montana's National Guard gets federalized and shipped overseas. So that leaves Montana without a military force. And so uh, some of the communities in Montana start forming home guards or local militias to, to, to um, train and, and so forth and be prepared in case war breaks out on American soil in their minds. And this was something that also concerned Stuart because he had to figure out a way to have some sort of authority over these individuals instead of just having them run loose as vigilantes across the state. Um, and some of these organizations, you know, they, their, their intent uh, wasn't, wasn't to repress or to put the state under martial law or, or any of those things. They actually thought that they were doing their patriotic duty and providing some type of security. And one of the things that had occurred in Montana shortly after that declaration of war in April of 1917 was an IWW strike broke out in the northwest corner of the state about two weeks later. Um, about 75 men working for the Eureka uh, Lumber Company walked out on strike was also the first place that federalized National Guardsmen were posted during the war uh, to break a strike. Um, one of the reasons that they were placed there, in um, Governor Stewart's opinion, was because uh, the Great Northern Railroad ran through Eureka and they needed to protect that um, transcontinental link across the, across the High Line. But they were there essentially to, to, to break the strike. And it was an IWW strike. The interesting thing about that strike is by July of 1917, it had spread from Little Eureka, Montana in the northwest corner of the state all the way to the Pacific Coast um, and the Pacific Northwest and shut down uh, just about entirely the Pacific Northwest timber industry. So that's a pretty big deal. And again, it's the IWW that's getting credit for that because it's their, it's their uh, members and so forth that are leading the charge on that. And so... He has to figure out how to how to deal with that type of scenario. He's also very aware that a strike is going to occur um, before it happens. Uh, the Lumber Manufacturers Association in Montana has infiltrated um, the IWW, and they are sending reports from the private detective agency that is spying on their founding convention in Spokane in March of 1917 and telling the governor exactly what they have planned. They're going to strike the first, um, the first company that begins their spring drive in, in 1917, and they're kicking in around an amendment that if the United States declares war, all of their union members will refuse to sign up for the draft. So this is a pretty big deal. Um, so war is declared. These guys go on strike. For all Stewart knows, these individuals are also going to refuse to sign up for the draft. Joseph Ratty, who's actually an organizer for the IWW and Whitefish, is writing letters to Big Bill Haywood back in Chicago saying, hey, we, we talked about having this general strike in case there was a draft instituted. What do you want me to tell the men? Do we tell them not to register to the, for the draft? Do we tell them to go ahead and register? What do, what do we need to do here? Haywood was kind of wishy-washy on that and it actually told Ratty it was up to each individual to make up their own mind how they wanted to handle that situation. So the interesting thing about that is Joseph Ratty actually registered for the draft. And when you look at his draft registration card, um, he, he's a natural born citizen. He was born in New Jersey. 
but the individual who filled out his card makes a note on it that he thinks he's foreign born. So it must have been one hell of a New Jersey accent. <laughs> Ratty actually gets drafted and he gets sent to uh, Washington State and he's there when the federal government cracks down on the industrial workers of the world and starts arresting all the leadership. So he actually gets arrested while he's in uniform and sent to Chicago to stand trial and I think he's sentenced to five years in Leavenworth um, for his IWW activities, even though he's in, he's in uniform. The interesting thing about him as well is that he is buried in Minneapolis and he has a military headstone. So you can be a, you can be a, a soldier and still be a rebel, for sure. Uh, so there's a lot going on, and you can understand why um, the general populace is getting nervous and Stewart's getting nervous and legislators are getting nervous. You also have draft riots, um, especially in Butte, that are occurring where Irish, Finns, and uh, German workers are protesting the US, U.S. entry to the war. They're protesting the draft and so forth. Butte is under martial law. There are troops up in northwest Montana. I mean, things are, things are looking pretty serious, um, as well as trying to handle the fallout from the speculator Granite Mountain Mine fire and what occurred there. Uh, and then to add to this boiling pot, Frank Little comes to Butte in late July 1917. Um, U.S. Attorney Burton K. Wheeler is urged by local authorities to arrest Frank Little after he's made a couple of speeches in Butte and prosecute him under the Espionage Act. Um, Wheeler's biggest problem is, is that he's interested in following the law. And so he takes a look at the Espionage Act. He can't find anything in the act that Little violated. He also knows that he has to cover his rear end a little bit. So he does a very smart thing. He asks the lead counsel for the Anaconda Company, L.O. Evans, to look at the Espionage Act, look at what Frank Little is being accused of, and find in the law where he needs to be arrested. And Evans just kind of had to shrug his shoulders and says, I don't see anything. So they didn't arrest him. And I think it was two days later, Little is kidnapped out of his hotel room. And, uh, and I always get behind on my slides and uh, lynched um, from a railroad trestle on the outskirt, uh, outskirts of Butte. Uh, so again, the tension is building. The governor is inundated with telegrams and letters and so forth from across the country asking what he's going to do about this type of vigilante activity. Um, the locals are, 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 are clamoring for a special session. Um, one of the reasons they're clamoring for a special session is because in their minds, if there had been a tougher law on the books than the Espionage Act, Frank Little would have been in jail and law-abiding citizens wouldn't have had to take the, the law into their own hands and lynch him for, for good cause. He'd have been in jail. So it wasn't so much about saving Frank Little's life. It was from keeping those poor, loyal citizens, patriotic citizens, from having to kill him. So it seems logical. Um, and going through the governor's papers uh, here, it's a uh, it's a uh, pretty interesting. I'm gonna go one more. There we go. Uh, to read the correspondence and so forth that he's getting um, from across the state about this special session, and some of his responses back to you. I love this response that he writes to uh, W. F. Winkleman of Savage, Montana. Um, it's in regard to a newspaper clipping that Winkleman had sent him. Um, where the, the local newspaper was supporting the governor's uh, um, decision to call a special session. So Stewart writes him, your letter with the clippings has been received and I'm glad to get the dope. He's a hip cat. Um, so with pressure increasing and with him getting the dope from the locals that this needs to happen, he issues a proclamation for a special session. Um, and the proclamation is fairly pointed. He didn't want to have the legislators come to town and do a whole bunch of things. He, wanted, he had targeted um, issues in mind that they needed to address and he wanted to hold it to that. There was a few additions that he had to make to the list just from public pressure. Um, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was all over him about supporting a national prohibition. So they wanted some type of 
of, of resolution or something from the, from the special session. Um, the suffragists were all over him as well about uh, a, a, a national amendment to the Constitution um, about uh, women's suffrage and so forth. So there were certain things outside the scope that he initially wanted to call this special session, but primarily um, he needed to provide some type of amendment to the existing seed grain law. Uh, Montana farmers were having a hard time getting their hands on seed grain so that they could plant. And Montana farmers at this time were being urged to go into debt up to their eyeballs um, to put uh, more seed in the ground to support the war effort. Because not only did they have to feed um, the American soldier overseas, they had to feed the folks at home, and they had to feed those starving individuals in Europe who, um, who uh, whose farmland and so forth was being destroyed by the war. So there's a lot of pressure on, on making sure that the farmers were able to get the seed that they had. And, and the law that was on the books at this point um, restricted that, that flow. Also needed to provide a moratorium for soldiers and sailors to protect them from loss by legal proceedings and statutes of limitation. Because if they're fighting overseas in France, and they're ordered to appear before a court for, for whatever purpose. There's Obviously, they're not going to be able to do that. So they need to have some way to protect um, the, the uh, Montana soldiers that are overseas. Uh, he also wanted to legalize the existence and provide for the maintenance of the State Council of Defense. Because as I said, he started that after war had already been declared and after the session had started. So there was no legislative mandate on the Montana Council of Defense and there was no legislative appropriation to fund the organization. So he needed that to happen during the special session. Um, he also wanted to provide for the legal organization and maintenance of a home guard um, so that he could have some authority, some control over these uh, these uh, home militias and so forth that were growing up. Uh, he needed to define sabotage, criminal syndicalism, and industrial and political anarchy so that they could provide um, appropriate punishment for that. And that was directed primarily at the IWW um, and, um, the, uh, and any other union that was going to strike during this time period. Also define seditious, treasonable, and disloyal uh, utterances and acts and provide for a punishment of those as well. Um, absentee voting, uh, if you will, um, having a means for Montana soldiers and sailors to be able to vote um, while serving overseas in, in, in Montana elections. And then, of course, um, giving in to the Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, uh, to vote upon the question of ratification of an amendment to the federal constitution in regards to uh, national prohibition. Um, Stewart addressed the special session in February, of, uh, February 14th, 1914, Valentine's Day, um, and regarding the reasons why he wanted the session, um, primarily because, again, they had adjourned in March of 1917 and they had gone to war in April of that, of that year. So this was one way to fully put Montana on a wartime footing. Um, helping spur the momentum for this was news from overseas of the sinking of the first uh, U.S. troop ship in the war, the SS Tuscania. Um, it was sunk off the coast of, uh, off of Ireland. There were 213 uh, U.S. soldiers on board, 384 crew. Uh, it was torpedoed on the evening of February 5th. Uh, there were 210 dead. Of those 210 dead, seven of them were from Montana. And all of them were serving with the 20th Engineers, um, which was a forestry battalion that was formed uh, um, to go overseas and, and cut timber in France. Um, since this occurred just days before uh, the governor addressed the legislature, um, and despite the fact that this isn't a huge loss, it was still something that added weight to what he was saying um, because as far as he was concerned, this legislative session needed to occur. Uh, legislation had to be passed to address these issues for no other reason than to make sure that there was the same level, level of patriotism at home as 
the Montana soldiers and sailors serving overseas were exhibiting by serving their country. And so he also made reference in his uh, proclamation speech before the legislature to the fact that it was not fair for grieving Montana mothers to hear talk in the streets and local establishments in opposition to the war when their sons were serving in harm's way. So as you can imagine, this carried quite a bit of weight, not only with the legislature, but with the public as well. And this was reported pretty heavily in uh, especially the Missoulian um, newspaper. So the special session starts and they get down to business. I mean, they make no bones about what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. Oops, there we go. So the first thing they're gonna do is address the uh, seed law. So one of the issues with the seed law um, was pointed out to him by Orville Stanberry of Guilford, Montana, who wrote him saying, I see by the present law, a man cannot get seed unless he has patent to his land. Unless this is amended to apply to all class of farmers, it will not help the homesteader any. For instance, in my own case, I have a homestead and I am renting another section, but under the present law, I cannot get a bushel of seed to plant. Um, so the old law had barred that. Uh, as such, they passed House Bill 10, uh, which allowed counties rather than the state to incur indebtedness for the purpose of purchasing seed grain for these needy farmers, um, whether they owned or rented. Uh, House Bill 13 addressed the issue of, of establishing a lien on growing crops and grain thresh for the purchase price. And the other part of this is that grain price prices had risen steadily um, since the war had started in 1914. And then by the time the United States got into the war, um, they were at their peak and they froze the price. So farmers for the first time in a long time were making really good money. Bush, uh, wheat was selling um, for quite a bit uh, more than it had typically had uh, per bushel. And so this was, this was a perfect time for these individuals to expand and they were urged to expand. So essentially what he was, uh, this legislation did was urge the farmers uh, to incur more debt and also encourage the state banks to loan to these individuals whether or not they were totally secure loans or not. So they actually were risking not just the farmer and the farmer's land but the health and welfare of the bank and that would actually come back to bite Montana in the 1920s. <coughs> and then of course House Bill 18 which appropriated $500,000 for the operation and maintenance of the Montana Council of Defense. And as Zoan had mentioned, the Montana Council of Defense's primary um, goal was to assist the farmers um, and those individuals growing um, food products for the war effort um, and to help mobilize that. And so he finally had a, a, an appropriation for, for, the, uh, for the Council of Defense. The next issue up for debate was suffrage. Uh, and to address that, they passed House Joint Memorial Number no. 2 uh, to the Senate and Congress uh, to pass an amendment to the federal constitution giving women the right to vote. Um, as I mentioned, Stewart had been a supporter of that uh, in Montana. Um, we had sent Jeanette Rankin to Congress, the first woman to serve in Congress, and so it seemed that if we had a woman in Congress representing Montana, we should be open to the idea of allowing all women across the country um, the right to vote and, and serve as well. Um, you know, and what better time to go sober than when you go to war? <laughs> I mean, seriously, uh, the Women's Christian Temperance Union seemed intent on making sure that Uncle Sam's servicemen were stone cold sober when they hit the beaches in France. I think I would have rather been wasted, but that's okay. <laughs> um, Laura Bailey was president of the WCTU uh, local in Collins and Mrs. O.F. Conan, vice president of the Livingston WCTU um, were among the very few or the, the very many that telegrammed Governor Stewart saying, you know what, prohibition is a wartime measure. How can we in good conscience use grain to produce alcohol when we need grain to feed the starving individuals in Europe and to feed our soldiers overseas. So they were promoting prohibition as a wartime measure and asking for um, 
Montana to pass a, res a resolution to that effect. And they did, House Joint Resolution Number 2, um, which urged the, the ratification of an amendment to the Constitution um, on the prohibition of the manufacture, sale, and transportation of intoxicating liquor. So, hello, Al Capone. The most serious issue uh, for them to deal with was uh, sedition. And um, the Espionage Act had been passed in 1917, uh, but it dealt specifically with issues of espionage. Um, Stewart and some of those other individuals were more interested in broadening that out to encompass a broader range of, of what they saw as violations of federal law during, or, uh, during that time of war. Um, Montana Senator uh, Henry Myers, I always get it, is Myers, um, had actually introduced a sedition law in Congress that year as well in 1917, and I believe it didn't even get out of committee um, because folks thought it was just too repressive. And so it died uh, in committee on the federal level. So in 1918, in February of 1918, when, when uh, Montana was holding its special uh, session, that was gift wrapped and handed to the state legislature and said, hey, why don't you use this? And so that's essentially what they did. Um, they took uh, almost verbatim Meyer's uh, uh, sedition law and implemented it. Um, and there were petitions from all across the state about the need for a sedition law. Uh, Highwood, uh, the Eureka Patriotic League, uh, Lee Ford, who was president of the Great Falls National Bank, was urging the passage of a sedition law. Um, he was very concerned about the, uh, uh, the activities of labor unions in the Great Falls area, um, in part because they had established a militia supposedly to protect um, those areas in Great Falls that uh, supported the war effort, but he was, he was afraid that they were actually using that as a cover to spark the revolution. Um, Joseph R. Jackson, the Silver Bowl County, uh, County Attorney, also was extremely interested in um, the passage of a sedition law so that they could start cracking down on some of those more revolutionary types in Butte and, and uh, start letting the law take over. And again, as I mentioned, there were those who pointed out that Frank Little would have still been alive, if not in jail, if we would have had a tougher um, law on the books and, and to, to, uh, to preserve his life, which they probably would have convicted him and sentenced him to death anyhow, so. Um, same way with the same way with the horn, uh, the Home Guard. I, I love this uh, this uh, telegram from W. Uh, M. Wooldridge of Hinsdale Val Valley County, um, talking about the uh, Home Guard units in Hinsdale and Haver, Chinook, and Malta. Uh, he writes, "We are at war. Some dandel things are being done. We have no militia. Something must be organized to take the place of our sons now in France. And what is more fitting than that?" than that the fathers of those sons perform the duty. As for the labor shortage nationwide, Woodbridge uh, recommended allowing the Chinese to immigrate to the US where they could assist in the farms. And he wrote, of course, I know the attitude of labor towards this matter, and I fear their attitude will oblige many of our people to go hungry before this struggle is over. So labor's really getting a black eye during this, uh, this uh, time period. There's also a opposition to the passage of a sedition law, and it does primarily come from the labor side of the issue. Uh, the Deer Lodge Central Labor Council sends a uh, telegram to Governor Stewart asking that he holds off signing any legislation until they get a chance to come to Helena and testify in opposition to the law and talk to him. Um, James B. Finley, who's the Secretary Treasurer of the Montana State Council of Con uh, Carpenters, is concerned because two uh, members of the Carpenters Union who had served in the legislature in 1917 have now been called into service, so their seats are vacant. So he's asking Stewart to hold off calling the session until they can get two people appointed to those seats that are friendly to labor so that they can offer some opposition to the legislation that they're proposing. Stewart informs him that he thinks he can get things done with the people that he's got. And so they don't fill the two vacant seats that the Carpenters uh, Union members had. Um, there was also an issue with the farmers. 
Um, the IWW was raising hell in the, in the timber industry. They were raising hell in the mining industry. The nonpartisan league was, was stirring up uh, the, uh, the farmers. And um, Stewart wrote to uh, Mr. Morris in Haver, Montana, it seems to me that the time had come when somebody should call the hand of these agitators and see where they stand. Farmers, generally speaking, are loyal and patriotic. There are only a few of them that are of the IWW type that are led astray by a few agitators. Recently, since the farming industry has developed, a lot of politicians have come to the conclusion that their salvation lies along the line of patting the farmer on the back and kowtowing to him. There is a necessity for assistance in some instances, but nothing like the amount estimated by some of the ones who have been doing the talking. In this case, Stewart was writing of those farmers who had actually heckled him during a meeting in Great Falls um, because uh, they were members of the nonpartisan non league. Uh, as he writes, the, legislation, the legislature will start off today and I'm hoping they will deliver the goods um, to, uh, to tamp down the, the discord. He did caution in his opening speech that care should be taken that no machine be created for the oppression of the innocent. The law should be plain and unequivocal, but should be so drawn that its provisions cannot be misapplied or its operation turned aside to the accomplishment of unworthy purpose. So he was concerned to a degree about exactly what they would unleash by passing the legislation that they, that they did. Senate Bill 1 was an act providing for the creation and appointment of the Montana Council of Defense. And it seems like after the Montana Council of Defense got their legislative authority, they took the gloves off and they became much more than what they originally were supposed to be. And then they started passing out all these edicts and rules and so forth about what was acceptable and what was not, who was patriotic and who was not, those types of issues. Sen uh, Senate Bill 2 was an act defining criminal syndicalism in the word sabotage. Uh, sabotage was something that was tossed around quite a bit in regards to discussions of IWW activity. The IWW actually promoted uh, that notion themselves, um, that they were not uh, opposed to using sabotage to, 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 uh, to achieve their, their, uh, their goals. Um, also, uh, it prohibited the teaching or suggestion of, of the overthrow of the government, um, violence, and the commission of an unlawful act. Um, House Joint Res uh, Memorial 1 um, asked Congress to pass uh, legislation defining as a crime and providing punishment for all acts of individuals, associations, corporations, and partnerships done in an attempt to be done that may be construed as sedition or sed seditious or um, sabotage, promoting sabotage. House Joint Resolution 1 was a joint resolution regarding the labor situation throughout the state of Montana and the Northwest and the urgent need for legislation providing for the location, registration, and classification of these individuals, whether or not they were loyal or disloyal. Um, House Bill 6 addressed um, desecration of the flag and made that illegal. House Bill 15 um, outlawed the manufacturing, buying, selling, transporting, and possession of uh, explosive materials with the, quote, intent that the same shall be used for the injury or destruction of persons or property. It seems like that would have been a law somewhere already, but I guess it's good to double down. Um, so by the end of the special session, Governor Stewart and the legislators who had met felt that they had things um, well in hand. They addressed those issues of most importance, um, the seed grain law, uh, sedition primarily. Um, and at the conclusion of the special session, Governor Stewart believed that Montana would be on a much more stable footing as the war progressed. Nobody, is, nobody saw the war ending in 1918. Um, most of the predictions coming out were that the war would probably grind on until about 1920 before um, Germany and her, her central powers would fold. Um, but, and this is, this is another quote, um, and this is from Francis Gavin. As we know, history is full of surprises and unintended consequences, and intent rarely produces the obvious and desired outcome. And this is kind of what occurs with the, uh, with the, with the special session in 1918 in Montana. Um, I don't think that those legislators foresaw 
the arrests that would occur and the convictions of those Montana residents for um, for sedition and incarceration. Uh, those were this 35 individuals that Schweitzer pardoned? 77? 77 or 78. Okay. Um, you know, I don't think I, the legislators and the governor didn't, I don't think, foresee that type of uh, activity occurring. Um, the interesting thing about the sedition law, um, the one that the United States government passed in 1918 went off the books at the end of Woodrow Wilson's term. Um, the Montana sedition law, however, stayed on the books until the early 1970s before it was removed finally. So it's kind of interesting when you compare, uh, when you compare the two. And as I said, this is kind of a 30,000 foot view. There's a lot of moving parts that are going on here. There's some extremely good books out there that delve a lot deeper into the, t into the topic. Uh, Clem Work's book, Darkest Before Dawn, which you could get at the museum store. Michael Kennedy's book over here, which talks about how the United States as a whole prepared itself for the war. And so I would encourage you to take a look 